Good morning. I appreciate, I appreciate all the enthusiasm for Hobbes. Okay, let's get our minds focused here. Let's get started. What we're going to do today is we're going to start our discussion of Hobbes. We're going to lay out the sort of foundations of his thinking. But when we come back in two weeks, we'll then trace how Hobbes constructs his commonwealth. Okay, so let's turn our attention then to Hobbes, one of the great works of political theory, the first sort of modern work of political theory, really, in the sense that Hobbes's political philosophy is built around what we call social contractarianism, or the idea of a social contract. We saw that idea of a social contract hinted at when we read the Crito and when Socrates laid out to his friend his reasons for refusing to escape. Uh, we saw an intimation of what that social contract could look like. But when we turn to Hobbes, we find an iteration of that contract in much fuller form. Hobbes uses the social contract not as Plato did as a basis for respecting the law, but instead more uh, fundamentally, more comprehensively, as a basis for formulating the existence of the state. Or we might say that under the Hobbesian view, political society is itself a function of the social contract. And that idea still informs the political societies that we have around us today. So we all live in societies that are essentially reliant upon the idea of a social contract. And that idea then of a social contract, social contractarian theory, Hobbes is the principal architect of, uh, of that idea. So in that regard, he's a very modern thinker. He's reaching for concepts which underlie our existing modern political thinking. On the other hand, the political form that Hobbes is reaching for, which he summarizes in the title of his book, Leviathan, could not be further from what we would imagine to be the ideal political outcomes that we seek for ourselves today. For if on the one hand, he empowers the individual via this mechanism of the social contract, and he postulates as part of that idea, a very radical form of equality and even freedom. Nonetheless, the government that follows from that radical equality and freedom is about the most repressive and absolutist government that you could imagine. Essentially, Hobbes's political vision is built around the construction of a political society in which power is concentrated absolutely in the hands of a sovereign authority. It's one of the tensions that exists inside this book that is well worth exploring in some detail, which is why we'll be spending the next three lectures on the, on the topic. To give you a sense of what that political vision is, we need look no further than the frontispiece of the book that was produced for the first edition when it was published by a French illustrator working closely with Thomas Hobbes. It's a very interesting illustration because Hobbes had a very clear idea of what he wanted the picture at the front of his book to look like. And so there was a lot of correspondence back and forth to produce this frontispiece, as it is called. And you can see then that we have here in this one image a summary of Hobbes' political ideas. The Leviathan, which is a term he took from the Bible, the biblical Leviathan, the famous sea monster. The idea of the Leviathan, a supreme force you can see here is represented in the form of monarchy. There is a king wearing a crown, carrying in each hand the symbols of state, the regal symbols of state, the sword and the scepter. But you can see that the body of the king is made up of all of the different constituent elements of society. All the different people actually make up the body of the king. And then you can see that in its vertical plain, you can see then the relationship that's created that all the institutions and organs of society, including, for example, defense and military, as well as the church and the law, are all subordinate to this royal figure, all subordinate to this absolutist symbol of power. So the commonwealth that Hobbes wants to constitute is a commonwealth based upon a principle of what we call absolutism namely the concentration of absolute authority in the hands of a single sovereign entity, as demonstrated by this, by this frontispiece. 
Perhaps most striking is the role of the church in uh, Hobbes's conception, because you can see very clearly that the church is placed below the sovereign authority and not above it. We saw already in our discussion of Machiavelli that one of the reasons why that text is so extraordinary is because Machiavelli undoes or maybe says circumvents the kind of pre-existing medieval conception of power and authority where the king is a representative of divine will and the role then of temporal authority is to order the affairs of people such that they align with divine authority. Here we can see Hobbes keeping up with that Machiavellian reordering of that idea by placing the church, ecclesiastical authority, clearly below the image of the sovereignty, and we might note then below the people themselves, since the body of the sovereign and the people in Hobbes' conception are identical. So what we want to do then is to figure out, in a way, is to explain this picture. What is it that Hobbes is telling us in terms of his political theoretical construction that explains or makes compelling this mode of authority. How do we travel from a vision of radical freedom and equality in which we are all of us empowered to form a social contract, which places the agency then with the individual, how do we get from that point to a point then where all of that freedom, equality, and agency is then subordinated inside the body of or inside the institution of sovereign authority. That's the challenge for us in working out what is going on in Hobbes. So what we want to do today is talk a little bit about where Hobbes came from, who he was, and the climate in which this work was written. And then I want to turn my attention to the last part of the first book, which is Hobbes's law, general consideration of who we are as human beings, a sort of disquisition on human nature, if, if you will. And then when we come back, we'll consider the mechanics of how he sees the commonwealth, the construction of sovereign authority from that. But we're going to start first then with, with who he was, what he wrote this, why he wrote what he did, the, kind of the larger sort of political context, uh, and then explore some of the basic principles of Hobbesian thought that leads him to this particular vision of sovereign uh, authority. One thing we're going to do today as well is learn how to read Hobbes. Hobbes is one of the great stylists, I should note, of the English language. The way that he writes English is quite extraordinary, and I appreciate for non-native speakers, when you first look at Hobbes, it seems very, very difficult and tricky language indeed to get through. But there is a way to read Hobbes that makes the work, I think, flow a bit more easily. So let's talk about who Thomas Hobbes was, uh, who this figure was, before we jump into the text. So he was born in 1588. Normally the year you're born doesn't really matter that much other than to maybe place you within a broader time frame. But 1588 is a particularly notable year. Why? The Spanish Armada? It's the year of the Spanish Armada. Hobbes is born in England the year that the Spanish naval forces are humiliated off the coast of England. What was the Spanish Armada fought over? To restore a Catholic monarchy. Indeed, it was to bring, to restore Catholicism to the schismatic Kingdom of England, which under Elizabeth I had embraced the Anglican or the Reformed Church. So that's to say that Hobbes is born into this environment of religious schism, and indeed in a very year which sort of symbolizes that religious schism, in which we see huge amounts of resources deployed in order to impose a kind of single vision of the faith, as we know, unsuccessfully. So in that sense, the year of his birth, I think, is highly symbolic with respect to his future political project. Because one of the ways to read Hobbes is an attempt to move political thinking forward in a systematic way so that it is not reliant upon ecclesiological or theological foundations to establish political order. I think that's one of the key uh, achievements of this text is to create a way of thinking about political society that obviates or at least goes around a theological or ecclesiological basis for authority to secularize our thinking of, of the state. And the reason that matters is because if people can't agree on what the true religion is, then it's not going to serve as a very likely <coughs> basis for establishing meaningful and enduring political peace and stability. Another noteworthy date, which also links to this larger theme, is the year uh, 1648, which happens three years before the first appearance of this book in 1651. It's the Treaty of, the Peace of Westphalia. Westphalia, right? It's the Treaty of Westphalia. Remember that? That ended the Thirty Years' War. 
What did the Treaty of Westphalia do? It's two things I think that are worth uh, singling out. The first is that it ended the Thirty Years' War. The Thirty Years' War was a conflict that merged geopolitical interests with religious interests. Nominally, it was a war fought over the future of the various reformed and or Catholic uh, states inside Europe. But the religious lines that informed the Thirty Years' War were heavily blurred. Hence, you saw, for example, French regal or French Catholic money being poured in to support Protestant causes. The religious differences were blurred with the geopolitical interests of the parties involved. And the scale of destruction wrought by the Thirty Years' War was, in Central Europe, very significant indeed. It's estimated that many tens of thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, died of starvation as a result of the deprivations created by uh, those three decades of conflict. So the first point that it demonstrates the Thirty Years' War is that it reinforces this idea that religious difference creates instability that will be then used and or manipulated to further geopolitical ends. The second point about the treaty itself, the principle of Westphalia, was that it subordinated the question of faith to the question of politics, so that under the terms of Westphalia, the decision as to whether you would be reformed or you would be part of the Roman church depended then on the ruler. It recognized or it uh, solidified that principle of faith as subordinate to authority, which is then what we find Hobbes then picking up in, in the Leviathan, that idea that in order for you to have religious stability, you have to then make the question of faith subordinate to the larger question of political stability. This third point that I'll make with respect to this is the more local or immediate context around Hobbes' own life. Hobbes did not write the Leviathan when he was living in England. He actually wrote it when he was living in France, which is why he had a French illustrator do the drawing for him. And the reason he was living in France was because he had been working for or was continuing to work for, a family that was allied with the English monarchy. But the problem with that was that at the period which Hobbes was writing this text, the English monarchy had been deposed. We see the execution of Charles I and then the rise of English republicanism under the figure of Oliver Cromwell during the so-called English Civil War, which lasts through the 1640s up until basically the year of the publication of this book. Well, the interesting thing about the context of the English Civil War is it demonstrates, again, a core weakness of the pre-Hobbesian system of government. It's the kind of event that gets you thinking about questions around political stability. Because the question, once again, redounded to what would be the religious identity of the Kingdom of England. The worry was that Charles I was a crypto-Catholic or nurtured certain crypto-Catholic sympathies, and therefore, in order to secure the Protestant Reformation inside of England, an opposing force to the king rose up in an attempt to solidify, uh, solidify English reform. Religious differences were decisive in terms of shaping the two sides in the English Civil War. And when the king's head was chopped off, when they beheaded the king, that act as regicide, right, the act of killing the king, reinforces the idea of uh, needing then to have a more reliable basis for authority, right? Who is a king if you can simply chop off his head and simply replace the system of political authority that he represents? That model, if you will, of dynastic personalized rule is too fragile in a context where there is a great deal of social instability driven by deep differences between people. You need a better system of thinking through political authority. And so it's in the, I think in the near-term context of the English Civil War that we find the bulk of Hobbes's motivation to produce the Leviathan emerging. Given that his own country had collapsed into political tumult, it is now time for us to think through the question of upon what basis should we constitute, should we constitute sovereign, sovereign rule. The curious thing is that he arrives at a model that, as you see from this picture, essentially argues for the restoration of kingship. So the solution that Hobbes presents to us in the Leviathan, in the context of an English civil war in which the king has been decapitated, is another kingship, which doesn't seem to advance the argument very far along at all. 
But the difference is that the absolutism that Hobbes eventually produces in the Leviathan is a very different kind of absolutism than the kind that we see being practiced more generally amongst European monarchs. This is not an absolutism based on God's will or based on the idea that you have a divine right to rule, which was the theory articulated by, for instance, James I of England in 1603, that God had given him the right to rule. Instead, this is an absolutism which, as we see from this picture, is based upon the power that derives from each individual sovereign person. And so instead of being an act of transcendental authority, that God orders the universe and God has now willed that you, James, or you, Charles, or you, Louis, or whoever, shall now reign over people, instead it reverses it, it materializes it, and now what it does is it places that same conception of sovereignty, absolute power, but instead of deriving it from a transcendental source, God, now it derives it from a material source, you and I, from the people themselves. It's a model of absolute sovereignty, which is drawn from the principle of the sovereignty of the self. And in this is a fundamental reconceptualization of power, no less than the fundamental reconceptualization than we explored with Machiavelli. You may recall to return to our discussion yesterday and of last week with respect to Machiavelli, that he explicitly discards political theorizing based on what he calls unrealistic fantasies about who people ought to be, and instead constructs a model of power based on who people are. People ought to be moral, ethical, God-fearing, obedient, loyal servants. Is that, in fact, who people are? No. What are we? Self-interested, greedy, inconsistent, treacherous, and so on. And so, therefore, just as Machiavelli's politics wants to be grounded, or his political theory, shall we say, is grounded in a reading of humanity as it is, not as it should be. Similarly, we might say for Hobbes, it's a conception of sovereignty that has a more stable foundation than simply making reference to some kind of abstract transcendentalism, which, as the events of his own lifetime had shown, was hardly the basis for establishing consensus because what you might see as a transcendental source of authority may be very different from what your neighbor sees as a transcendental source of authority. We need a more stable basis upon which to constitute sovereign power that then everyone can agree with, something that we can all universally accept. And if we can derive some universal principle upon which sovereignty is derived, then we have created the basis for a universal sovereign power. And so unlike the kingship that was removed under the English Civil War, the kingship that Hobbes wants us to restore is a universal kingship in the sense that it makes claims to a universal sovereignty.